and miles till midnight. A story of timelines, artificial worlds, simulated races, and the galactic imprint, and the destiny of a blue world called Earth. One Million Miles Till Midnight, written by Solaris Blue Raven, is a journey through the mind's eye which allows the reader to surf a wave of technological and multidimensional intellect, revealing a bridge between conscious design and the truth. A multidimensional bleed through awakens the world of artificial intelligence to set sail into the frontiers of a vast multiverse, morphing planets and terraforming ascended worlds beyond the linear programs of a fated race. One million miles till midnight will awaken, inspire, prepare, and enlighten one to the many multidimensional states of consciousness and worlds we reside in. With every cell and atom, we are this truth and multiverse. One Million Miles Till Midnight, written by Solaris Blue Raven. Available now at Amazon.com and GlennNT.com. Don't wait, get your copy today. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host... Welcome back, everybody, to Strange Universe and Who's Behind the Mic. I am Solaris Blue Ribbon. My incredible guest tonight is Dr. Richard Allen Miller. We had an, in, an incredible conversation prior. Uh, Richard, you with me? Yes, I am. Okay, excellent. So we're going to dive into magic this hour. Okay, what where do you, you want to go with magic? I want to go with uh, the hardcore aspects of occultism and your background and, and how you got moved or pulled into the covert um i don't want to call it covert but it's definitely the occultism and the crowley magic um yeah well isn't that interesting this is a true story it'll be in my biography in better words probably with pictures Excellent. but um when i first came out of graduate school i used to hang out at the quest bookstore a uh, theosophical society and uh they started talking about annie Besant and uh, Ledbetter, uh, and uh, uh, Manley Palmer Hall, and I, they, they would give free, uh, scholars would come in on Wednesdays and talk open mic, you know, on different topics, and I took to it like a, like a, a duck to water, I just, I, it just was natural for me. Now, I have some childhood history that has been written up in Veterans Today, and if you'd like, I can give you that article that Veterans Today, they did a big article on my childhood. My, oh, sure, my, sure. my, my mom and grandma were famous psychics working for the Seattle Police Department uh, that they actually did a TV show called One Step Beyond. And oh, wow. uh, it was a long time ago. And they were different stories about psychism. And actually, they were all from my mom and my grandma. Uh, but they did them as different people in different parts of the country, you know, the way the series went out. It was uh, uh, about the time Rod Steiger and others were doing, uh, 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 you know, uh, the Twilight Zone, things like that. It was called One Step Beyond. And that I was, remember that. I remember that show. Somewhere yeah. Was okay. So that was about my mom and grandma. And so in the 30s, mom tested very, very high in psychism. And so in the 50s, when I was in grade school, uh, Duke University came through uh, and were studying the children to see if there was a hereditary relationship in psychism. Now, that's in the 50s. And uh, my sister was normal, and I was a fourth stage telepath. And I was invited to join a special group of kids in Durham, North Carolina, called uh, uh, the the foundation for the study of men and it uh, was a three-story brick sorority house across the street from dr ryan's laboratories where they had all these special children fire starter kind of kids 
And I was part of that group and for about a week and a half, almost maybe 10 days. And I told my dad, I, I, I didn't want to be here anymore. I didn't care for this. And uh, my dad took me out. Now, this was back in the 50s when uh, it was allowed uh, to the parents still had control of their children. And th today, if I had been part of that organization, I don't I think they would have somehow or another managed to take the child away from the parent. Uh, that's how covert it's gotten today. Yeah. But, uh, so I always grew up with a mistake of something going on, that something might be special with me. What they used to write in the, the alleys of Seattle is telepath. And that means it's an individual that can change the reality of everybody around them by transmission. Uh, clairvoyant is the same thing. Uh, you and you do a clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience. It's always in terms of one of your five senses, but it isn't really working that way. It's a more uh, intricate uh, system of altered states that all kids go into, mm -hmm. and uh, we're trained not to go into them. Uh, isn't that interesting? Right. And yet, the ability to go into these states, you can do things that would appear to normal people as paranormal like ripping a car door off in a moment of stress, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So I've always had a, a draw toward the unexplained and was always interested. And of course, when I was a little kid, they had uh, uh, Safeway stores used to have these dictionaries that you'd buy one, one section a week. And after 10 weeks, you had this huge monstrous dictionary that was even better than, let's say, an encyclopedia or something. And uh, they had a, a series that came out called Man, Myth, and Magic. And I have that complete set. And that set has served me better than any single thing, including Manly Palmer Hall's Secret Teachings. I have uh, an exceptional library now over the years because I had an occult bookstore for you know, nine, 12 years, somewhere in there, Beltane. If nice. you go, on my old websites, there's a thing called the vault. It'll have pictures of the old things there. What basically happened was that I started to study uh, extrasensory perception as an extra sense. And that's when I made some discoveries. And how this all first started was uh, uh, Dr. Stanley Krippner invited me to New York in 1970, where I got to meet Edgar Mitchell. And Ed became a friend of mine. And then in 1971, when he was uh, doing the Apollo uh, 14, it was Apollo 14 mission studies, I was at Mission Control and part of that experiment, doing the ESP experiments with James Hirtak and Theodore Pierkos, whom I also wow. met in New York a year earlier. James Hirtak is still around with his wife, now lecturing around the country. I get to see him once in a while. Uh, that's 47 years, and Dr. Stanley Krippner was responsible for all of that and uh, is the one that introduced me to first SEAL Corporation and then later MRU, and so it's his fault. <laughs> yeah, he's the one that mentored me. Now, so let me ask you something before. I just want to stop you for a second here, but what were you doing at Mission Control? You were, you were doing ESP experiments? Yeah, well, because Mitchell was without past... Uh, there they are, right Damn on them. <laughs> Go ahead. They're, they're trying to, they don't know I'm doing radio, or they do. No, what, what, okay, I'm going to have to click my thoughts here again, because it disrupted me. Okay, um, you're going to have to uh, kill ESP me. ESP experiments at Mission Control. Yes, um, Mitchell is out in deep space, and Mitchell went behind the moon. And that meant I had a large mass in front of me, and I had a longer distance where I could measure how quickly ESP worked. Was it, uh, is it speed of light or slower? And uh, I discovered it wasn't the speed of light. It was instantaneous. It had nothing to do with mass. Like, yep, I agree. With the, with, okay, well, that's what we discovered, and is... Uh, one chapter in the book ESP Induction 
through forms of self-hypnosis. In 72, and no, it was in 74. Yes, it was in 1974 that Dr. Milan Riesel defected from uh, the Soviet Union uh, uh, seeking asylum here. And I was uh, the fortunate one to debrief him on his studies with ESP and it put the whole program of what extrasensory perception is and what it is not in my latest book, The ESP Induction. That, uh, by the way, was Nick Begich that published that. And uh, Nick, uh, I met him in Brisbane and then uh, that second year in Amsterdam. And he decided to be my patron, and publish my book and get me back into writing. You can nice. blame Nick. <laughs> Good, I like him. He's great. No, he's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Well, Nick brought me up to Chickaloon and I spent weeks up there. We were going to co-author a book together and it turned out he couldn't write it. It was beyond his technology. And so that later became Power Tools, which was the <laughs> second in the series. We were going to originally write uh, the Brain Spa. But going back to your question, I started with Tim Zell and Morning Glory Zell uh, and the Church of All Worlds. And I started writing for uh, Green Egg. And then I met Carl Wyshewski at Llewellyn and uh, my very dear friend uh, that wrote uh, the, uh, Real Magic, Isaac Bonwitz. Isaac was, uh, I called him, uh, Isaac the Unlikely. <laughs> you had to meet him. He was editor of Gnostica News, and I started writing for him. And so I started in neo paganism and witchcraft, and then graduated into alchemy, where I wrote The Modern Alchemist, and then evolved into what is called High Magic and Aleister Crowley. It was in 1968, I left the Quest bookstore with a single book, my first book that I checked out, which was called Magic, Theory and Practice. And I thought it looked like it was a book laid out like a physics book. And so I'm going to devour this book and determine what's real or not about Aleister Crowley. And as I got home, there's a knock on my door and there's these three little old ladies there from the Theosophical Society, very fearful for my soul and, and were going to warn me against the evil of Aleister Crowley. And the next scene showed me chasing three women down the street where they were screaming at a madman chasing them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and then in 1974, when I was doing Aleister Crowley, studying it more deeply, I met Phyllis Seckler. Phyllis Seckler was uh, uh, Grady McMurtry's wife. Uh, there's all kinds of people trying to call me, and they're all trying to interrupt me. I, I, that thing, yeah. I hate telephones. I like apologize. That. For okay, that. it's all right. It was a great show. We appreciate you being on. I saw okay, you. Okay. So what happened was um, I met Mildred Burlingame and Helen Parsons Smith. She was very cool. Phyllis was more, they were the three witches of Endor. <laughs> they were from the Agape Lodge of North Hollywood, 1948, with Kenneth Anger. I knew Lee Heflin. I met McFarland. I was running around with some crazy people back then. And <laughs> my education as a scientist was such that I am now the last man standing. I didn't blow myself up like Jack Parsons did. I, um, <laughs> I and L. Ron Hubbard, I just watched a great video on Netflix, uh, where uh, Anonymous goes after the Church of Scientology. Oh, man, was that an interesting video. You have no idea what cans of worms you open up. I was responsible for the bust in Boston with a thing called The Process, where they were like the children of God and doing a cult mind control on children. And in, uh, in a Boston Scientology church, the Church of Scientology is a bunch of trolls today. You've got uh, uh, some very cool actors, uh, you know, that I totally respect. Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, the, the famous actors. There's uh, several famous actors that belong to the Church of Scientology. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. I can't think of his name right now. 
who's the other one? Tom Cruise and uh, 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 the dancer um, did Saturday Night Live. John Travolta. John Travolta. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Rowe, my wonderful <laughs> producer. Both of these guys, both of these guys are spokespersons for the Church of Scientology. If you go up into Portland, uh, you'll find a place called centerpoint.com that uses brain drivers, and that's Bill Harris. And they're a bunch of trolls, and they're Scientologists trying to look for new blood. Be very careful and use the spell of invisibility. I use a lot of... Uh, oh, uh, can, can, you, can you let us know about that one? How does that one go? What's that? <laughs> the spell of invisibility. Yeah, spell of invisibility. Low profile. Yeah, ah, very you nice. lurk. You don't leave your name, and you use a Tor browser so they can't find your IP address. <laughs> <laughs> okay. oh. That's how you do it, man. I, okay, so I am now uh, officially in OTO in 1972. I'm part of the Church of All Worlds in 1970. And then I start meeting Denning and Phillips. Uh, or Jim, where is that one? That, that's the Arm Solis out of England. Uh, Leon and Vivian Barshinsky, that's uh, Denning and Phillips. And uh, that's an interesting system of magic that took off after Golden Dawn, like OTO did. I am now part of the Order of the Silver Star, the Argym Argenum. I'm Jane Wolf Ranch. I have I'm in touch with Freighter Shiva, who ran uh, Solar Lodge during Charles Manson days. Oh my God! <laughs> well, Are you and, kidding? Go ahead. Listen, I've I've got stories, man. I want to hear the. <laughs> we only have an hour oh, left. Oh, weird. It's just like Hollywood would do it, you Thank know. God. Go ahead. Yeah. No, it, keep it, going. I love this. Go ahead. What's that? No, I'm enjoying this conversation. Go ahead. Yeah. It. Well, the stories go downhill from there. McFarlane up in. Uh, he was in Toronto. Um, was actually battling with Helen Parson Smith because there were unpublished uh, Simon F. and other books that Crowley had not published before his death. Now, here's an important thing to remember. In fact, just FYI, it was not uh, uh, Heydrich, Bill Heydrich, that was offered the caliph. I was offered the caliphate, uh, and I turned it down. And uh, that's when Breeze was given the, the caliphate out of New York, and then he moved the um, um, home lodge uh, to Berlin, which is where it is now. In Berlin, Deutsche Bleiben. Yeah, well, but uh, the whole thing originally, I, I'm not a cult leader. That's not what I want to do. I I have, I know exactly what I am, and I know what I'm going to do. And I'm going to come out with a whole series of books on pathworking, which will be the new generation's techniques in physics. And it's basically advanced physics with a mystery school. A woman, when she drives an automobile, is not thinking how internal engine combustion works as much as the ritual. If she puts the key in this way and turns it that way, she has expectations of something happening in the physical world. That is called cybernetic anthropology or uh, magic. Magic. That's, a lot of Aborigines live that way. And uh, in fact, to some minor extent, an argument can be made that it is a more detailed way of being in your environment uh, than the current ways we enjoy with man trying to make changes in everything. The soil, the chemistry, the insecticides, the gene genomes, the whatever. So, uh, you know, I, I have my own ideas uh, in the direction of physics. And I, I'm seeing now a loss of credibility in physics, because you have a bunch of peer reviewers that say, oh, yeah, that's that's uh, contrails, and I'm sitting there, oh, get a grip, man. I mean, <laughs> the, 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 the contrail doesn't last two hours in the atmosphere. How does that work? Mm -hmm. You know, they might last 10 seconds or uh, two minutes, but they're not going to last two hours, and uh, that's particulate, and here it is, and how do you explain that, sir? You know, and so... People that are in science are starting to give it a bad reputation by lying. Uh, I remember there was a change in technology uh, in the 80s. It was in the 70s. It was blue sky. It was like we had no idea where our research was going to take us. Let's go pursue it and see where we go. In the 80s, 
nothing was funded if it didn't have application. Mm -hmm. And that means somebody had said, we now know everything we need to know. Now what we're going to do is make money. Right. And uh, it changed technology and the way it works. Uh, uh, nuclear reactors are a typical example. Well, we know that uh, radiation uh, uh, refuge and, and garbage is, is going to be toxic. But by the time we have enough that we should worry about it, we'll have a way to fix it. We don't. Now, that is capitalism. And uh, that has gotten us into a lot of serious trouble by going, using technology that was not vetted or safe with a presumption that by the time we need it, we'll reach back and the baton is right there to slap in our hands. And it isn't. Yeah, I agree on that one. Well, so now we've got some problems across the board on a lot of different things going from emissions and the you know, greenhouse effect to nuclear radiation in certain areas of the world, including our oceans, being contaminated. And right. Well, I, don't you think they're just a byproduct of the psyche of the collective? That's uh, a sweeping way to take care of it. There is also a responsibility associated <laughs> with all of that. Uh, you've got to be accountable for your right. act. Well, and also energetic. Be accountable with what we do in ritual, too. Well, that's right. The ritual is a celebration of myth. You have, uh, uh, let's say, you're going to do a ritual around, uh, I don't know, Jupiter. It's for money or expansion or health. And uh, so, uh, but you need to have a switch. That was what was a problem with my mother was that she would have visions whenever they chose to happen kind of like Yuri Geller uh, he mm -hmm. couldn't control it it happened when it happened and when it happened it was amazing but it wasn't a controlled now I'm going to do it now I'm not and that's what's called a switch going from the sacred or the profane into the sacred a real magician the one I studied under for example, smelled really bad and wore the same clothing for too long to the point where there's food on his clothing and everything like that. Oh, God. <laughs> always knew when he was going to do a ritual because he shaved, showered, and put on clean clothing. And that was his switch of now I'm going to go from this state of consciousness to that state of consciousness. And it was with a, a switch where it didn't just happen arbitrarily when you were unexpected or unprepared for it you had that is what a ritual is about it is your switch of going from the profane into the sacred and when you go into the sacred you take your thought forms and your thoughts and you make them physical and that's what crowley called a magical child and that's done with sex magic and tantric yoga and what is called the mass of the holy ghost and you can augment and use uh, toys and tools, vibrators, whatever, drugs. Drinks. Well, let, let me ask you something real quick here. I know a lot of people, they really kind of associate Crowley with something that's very insidious and evil. Now, what is your you've, you've obviously done this path. So what is your impression of the work that he's put out? OK, so Crowley was Victorian period. If I were to cast him as a character, he would be Truman Capote. That would be the best Crowley I can find. Sarcastic, in your face, the way, not the way, the way. You know, he was like that. I have actual recordings of him speaking, so I know what he sounded like. He's like, sounded like Truman Capote. <laughs> and But he was in Victorian periods, which means he wanted to offend to wake you up so he would carve 666 in his forehead. Just, oh, oh it's so oh, oh. You know, he, he offended me. It was Victorian period. Mm -hmm. However, it's also important to remember, Crowley died as a drug addict in Hastings. And that teacher can only take you as far as they themselves have been. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm not a Crowleyite. Right. Drugs are a form of magic. It's a shortcut to grandma's house through the woods. And like all shortcuts, there are big, bad wolves. And so that's why uh, Leary, other magicians, would have said set and setting. Because when you take a mind alterant, you are, by definition, performing an act of magic. And if you are not prepared 
to do it correctly, there are all kinds of Alabama ticks and demons and, and things. And I can talk to you about demons. Yeah, I'd like to hear about that. Let, let's go there too. Because we, yeah, definitely. Okay. So when someone dies, there is a 3.2 ounce weight loss at the moment of death. What is that? I am going to suggest from my mentor, Sir Roger Penrose, that it is a form of uh, structured water in microtubules that goes back to the microverse. Now, it turns out in your dehydration at night and certain kinds of dreams are like many deaths. You actually go home to the multiverse. That's what dream states are about. That's not all dream states, specific forms of astral projection, of uh, uh, soul travel, what is called a shabad, where you listen to the sound current and you leave your body, uh, near-death experiences, uh, all have a similar event where the structured water goes home. Now, a poltergeist is usually formed, not to be distinguished from a ghost, a poltergeist or a ghost is something emotional happened, murder, fire, a tragedy uh, uh, that incurred such intensity of emotion, it took some of your soul or structured water and imprinted it into matter. And what's happening now is there, your soul is trapped between here and there. And so that's called first death. And the first death is where you're locked on earth in matter some way and you can't really go home. And uh, what happens next is you, that soul slowly starts to decay uh, like a body does with maggots. Uh, uh, astral, if you will, maggots. And <laughs> people like you and me have dead parts inside us that are dead. Um, you might have been raped. Right? I'm, I'm using this as a metaphor. Like you might have been raped and have a very aversion to sex and or the masculine and da 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 da. And that part of you that has been dead uh, will attract these maggots that are in this dead soul. And so when you do an exorcism, the soul is able to be released and is able to go home. It's thankful. It's able to leave. The problem is these entities are there in other forms like your shadow. In psychology, they call the shadow uh, is something you project on the ground, you know, from the sun. And it's a part of you. It is not you. And yet it is you. It's you in a lesser dimension. And so what you move, it moves. And there is a relationship to the two. But in Sumerian texts, I actually taught a course at Georgetown on demonology to a graduate level uh, because I'm an authority on the Lesser Keys of Solomon or the Goetia, the 72 fallen Lamega dime. Uh, they are basically the old 19th century magic, used square magic, where they would have a magic square if you add it this way, it's the same way as if you add it that way. All these numbers, they lay it out in the code. So it's somehow, uh, this one's Jupiter, and it, so it's got five going, five five numbers going this way and that way, and, you know, it all adds up this way and that way. And these are called magic squares. And what you would do is you would put your name, let's say Solaris, uh, S-O-L, it would go S would be here, O here, and over L over there. And that formed a geometric alignment or a geometry uh, that was called a sigil. And that was called sigil magic. Hartman and others and uh, current magic systems out of Germany uh, took off to, with OTO, with uh, William Wynn Westcott and some of the others that were part of that old Golden Dawn thing over Crowley. And where Crowley differed, he changed magic and used emotionals like voodoo. And the voodoo, the magic, is in the thought form of belief. And the more you believe it's going to work, the more it works. And that's why, you know, if someone puts a spell on you and you don't believe it, it gets reflected back to them threefold, like a light beam hitting a surface and it's reflected back. Or you absorb it. And if you, okay, you have the choice. 
And uh, that's because of your belief system. And you can change your beliefs like a pair of clothing uh, uh, because it's arbitrary. That's what beliefs are. They're arbitrary. If you had been born in fact, then you would not have been a Christian. And so that's that. And uh, that means that the belief systems to that extent are arbitrary and where you were born. And once you realize that, as a Navy SEAL, I trained my SEALs how to change those thought, those uh, belief systems because going to Iraq as a Christian could get your team killed. <laughs> and so it didn't mean you don't get rid of the belief. It's just not appropriate to use in that context. So they cloak their energy when it comes to their belief systems? What's that? Did they cloak their energy when it came to their belief systems? It Did is cloaking. It's just not appropriate. It's like uh, okay. in the summer, you don't wear a sweater. Mm-hmm. Going to Iraq, I don't need to be a Christian here. What I need to do now is be a da-da-da. Mm-hmm. Okay, mission. That's where you turned your mission into your purpose, where by definition, you couldn't fail. That's where magic goes. It's the use of these altered states where if you go into this state right here, you can um, have an ability in guessing 400 times over where you were there. And so you drop into this state when the bullets are flying because you don't want to think about where you want to run. You want to use instinct, your gut. And your gut will save your life where your brain will get you shot. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, because your brain says, if I move this way, I have two options. I'm going to get shot or I'm not going to get shot. Well, that means there's a high likelihood you are going to get shot because that's Merlin. When he said to Arthur, anything not specifically forbidden is mandatory. (laughs) Oh, I didn't see this. Yeah. Uh, Well, that's where uh, your, your brain makes all your beliefs true. And so if there's a 50% chance of you possibly getting shot, you can count on it. And so you don't work from that place. You work from a different place. And that place will save your life. And so uh, it's an altered state. And how to go into these things requires skill and training, just like meditation does. It takes time. Okay, there are toys that will enhance you, biofeedback, brain drivers, whatever, hammer, (laughs) <laughs> that change your altered state, drug, you know, that's why they use drugs in remote viewing. It enhances. It's magic. Which um, kind of drugs do they use specifically for that? Or for... For remote viewing. Do they? Remote viewing might be one of the tropane alkaloids, like okay. scopolamine. <laughs> oh, man, those things. I've heard those you know, things. Ones, you know, <laughs> I didn't want to talk about How it How could all. you even remember anything? Well, that's true, too. See, that's why they call it prototactic, paratactic, and syntactic modes of consciousness. You, you either go like as a shaman, or you can place your consciousness in the bird, in that flying bird, and see what the bird sees. But then when you bring it back to you, you have no memory of it. Or you have paratactic modes where you have a dream state. And I kind of remember a dream, and it was kind of prophetic. It says I'm going to have an accident if I go this way. And so you don't. Now, that's para. That means our typal, your semi-aware, and then syntactic modes of consciousness is when you actively change your heartbeat and respiration and uh, sex magic and biofeedback and uh, where there's conscious volitional awareness going from this state to that state. And that is the function of ritual. Right. Very good. Good information here tonight. I'll tell you what, Richard, I just love it. And and let everybody know once again how to purchase your books and also your new tapes that are coming out because I can't wait for that audio to come out. Oh, it'll be my pleasure. They're actually really interesting tapes and I'm going to make more of them the follow-up from where I started from uh, back in the 90s to what I know today. And so I'll be making more audio books. Uh, 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 my website is richardallenmiller.com, A-L-A-N, Miller.com, uh, and then uh, forward slash shop. If you want to go to the shop, you can get there by going to oak-publishing.com, or if you wanted to go to my Facebook connection at docram.com. I'll have the bookstore. Go right straight there, and you can buy things. The bookstore is finally 
functioning correctly now. We got hacked and we had creepies all going in and out of my thing. Just today, I've had 780 attempts at admin trying to break in. Wow. Yeah. That's just crazy. just today and that's since midnight this this morning um it it <laughs> i <laughs> i had to move to my own secure server because that amount of traffic would have locked up a normal server and then nobody would have been able to get on my line just because <laughs> it's got so many other creepy web crawlers and all kinds of creepy pakistanians uh ukrainian i, I don't know where they all come from canada uh you know who knows well, well, it just proves yeah, that you have I, a lot of critical data. You know, you have a lot of information that I think people should be reading and accessing. I, like I said, I, I love talking to you. I could speak to you for hours. <laughs> well, we we'll just have to go do a, a brownie schmore evening one time. <laughs> <by the way. laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah, you got the big picture giggle. Well, you know what you yeah. also need to do is write your biography because I've been getting on you about that, and I'd really like to see you do that. I uh, I'm not ready to do that. I I think what okay. I need, what I'm going to do is a picture book rather than words. Well, I might have a few words tying one picture to another, but I have pictures with me with my linear accelerator. Now that's a picture, man. Oh, right. <laughs> Can you go into that? What is it exactly? A linear accelerator. Yeah, yours. It's like yeah. A, it's like a a stiff CERN. <laughs> oh, you know no. what CERN is? CERN <laughs> is our attempt to create a rapid transit going from Geneva to Fermilabs in Chicago. <laughs> no, I think CERN is actually opening up wormholes. What do you, what do you think about that? That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, yeah Fermilabs. The distortions in the field is my point. It's, I don't think it's clear. I think energetically speaking, I think it's a distortion. Well, that's, here's the deal. You're having to create a uh, mini black hole and uh, imagine what that does to the earth. <laughs> Yeah, going into the out of. Um, that's um, rapid transit. There it is. Gives a whole new meaning to rapid transit. You know, or what the shaman would call uh, bilocation. <laughs> yeah, you're bilocating. All right, go ahead. How's Annie Lennox put it? I'm of two minds of this. Maybe. I just am besides myself. Yeah, I love Annie Lennox. She's like a female David Bowie. Um, the CERN thing is very concerning because uh, we're dealing with uh, tearing or opening portals in space time. And when you do that, there's all kinds of uh, creepy crud, just like there was demons. We didn't finish the demon story. Yeah, let's go back. Well, I want to say something. The 72 Megaton, I was able to identify. 68 of the 72 fallen angels, Beelzebub, Astra, as actual constellations in a Babylonian star map. Wow. Now it gets better. These were given names. And the names are interesting. Um, the names of Astra, Beelzebub, back then were jealousy, rage, anger, uh, uh, greed. Uh, what they were were qualities of men deemed unworthy of being human. Mm -hmm. And so they were called demons or lesser aspects of men that were to be avoided. And angels were the advances of men in higher states of consciousness. In other words, they were above man and below man. And that grimoire was originally written by Solomon the king, and it was called the Greater and Lesser Keys of Solomon. And throughout history, all of your various and diverse uh, basic uh, books on magic, grimoires, what they call uh, books on magic, the, Arm the grimoire of Armadale, Honorius, uh, Malphium, Malficorium, and all these different titles through history were basic translations of the original book on magic that was written by Solomon the King. Today, in a golden dawn period, Samuel McGregor Mathers did the most recent one, which is called The Greater Keys of Solomon, and then a second book called The Goetia, or The Lesser 
keys. And originally, it was all one book, and uh, uh, but you can you can read those books, and the sigils come from star maps, Babylonian star maps. So their technology, when Solomon the King was running the show, uh, had a level of technology that we don't even embrace in that. And when I say stuff like that, I'm talking about the old Colbrin um, uh, Bibles that Mark and Luke used during the period of Jesus was uh, what we now call the Old Testament. Um, it was included the Sefer Yetzirah, or the Book of Formation. And that is a book that relates sound to words because sound was a technology that moved space time. And so was dance or movement. And when you see ghost dance and the whirling dervish and um, oh, uh, you know, Mukumba, uh, dance, uh, you understand that there's uh, something else going on here that we have not incorporated into our current forms of technology. This epoch is called the sixth epoch or trial by fire and that means uh topasia that's uh electricity nuclear energy and <laughs> if we do not turn that switch off we will not have a seventh epoch it won't be human um the only thing i have seen survive in high nuclear waste is a black slime mold and it exists in those two areas, and I believe there are people are talking about black goo. Uh, <laughs> yeah, whatever that means. Uh, I, it's something that you get out of the Lock Center. And I have this creepy feeling that we're being terraformed. I do not look forward to the marriage of man with machine and the transhumanism movement. I don't, you know, augmentation. You know, Cyber City, like uh, William Gibson and others might write about. I uh, believe that the reason we have avatars is there's no way for us to go up into space. And Elon Musk at all wants to go up there and get that diamond in that mm -hmm. big. Yeah, you know, that he's big, big on the transhumanism now too, in the artificial brain with synthetic telepathy too. Yeah, well, there's all kinds of things going on now where we can clone and regenerate certain kinds of tissue, including nerve tissue. I had a severed perineal at my knee. My knee got crushed in Cambodia. And I remember uh, working with Robert O. Becker and a bunch of scientists, and I regenerated true nerve tissue and now have complete function of my knee. And nice. that, if that means that immortality, physical immortality, is well within our reach. We have life forms on this earth that we don't talk about, like the Nephilim and or Bigfoot and Sasquatch that uh, have been with us all through the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I, I, yeah, I personally think that man has been engineered into a number of different kinds of entities. I question what the fourth genome is and where it came from, rhesus negative in our blood. For example, that's completely alien, and it, right. there's no where did it come from? Right. Well, I don't believe none of us. I mean, I, none of us are from here. In my opinion, I, I don't believe any of us are from, originally from here. Obviously, from the stars. But uh, when you talk about certain things like the black mold, I think you were just discussing a minute ago. There. What about Antarctica? I know you've been out to Antarctica a long, long time ago. But what's your take on the craziness and the hoopla that's going on over there right now? I don't know. I can speculate. Okay. I have seen. Okay. I I can speculate. When I was there in the early 70s, I saw the Nazi base. I saw a Viking base further down that had been there from the 14th century. And then there were some caverns that went straight down 100 miles into the mountain. We had not the technology back then to, 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 to explore those yet. I was there to explore how the light worked in the cavern using bioluminescence. I remember... Uh, the big question is how could these caverns exist when uh, at 100 miles down the pressure 
uh, of molten steel or rock should be in plastic and there were, the integrity of these things would have collapsed and they didn't. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing that our government, others have figured a way to go down those caverns and they made a discovery down there. And what I have heard from some friends of mine at JPL, others, uh, it was they found Nephilim in stasis, just like in the movie Prometheus. And uh, that the Nephilim, uh, what happened when, uh, was it last month, when uh, uh, they started evacuating Antarctica, I guess it was several months ago, uh, I think one of them woke up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have done a BBC uh, 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 show uh, where uh, they interviewed me on the giant skull that was discovered in the 1860s in Pennsylvania and was then stored at the Smithsonian. And it disappeared, and that's an easy vet on what happened there. Cleopatra went up the Mississippi River looking for copper. We found her artifacts and so on on the Colorado in that area where the Golden Buddha was discovered. Uh, so, you know, we've been here before in other epochs of technology. And man advances very quickly, and then something weird happens. And it's always in 3,600-year cycles and 26,000-year cycles. Right. And, and so we have, uh, you know, what you don't have to look at it as something bad either. Uh, basically, the rule of, 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 of what I found physical pain is change. Everything's always changing. It, that's the rule. It doesn't remain the same. Things change. And um, so change is an opportunity. And all of this nonsense of money and uh, the elite uh, is all going to get. <laughs> that's all going to change in our case, just overnight. You know, just the grid going down, the sun uh, has is now emitting strange radiation from it, from this object up near Neptune, uh, is causing changes in our sun and the radiation pattern. And the UVBs that the sun is currently giving off uh, is now affecting farmers. Uh, the farmers are noticing that all the ant populations are disappearing and that flies are disappearing because neither are equipped to handle that kind of radiation on the surface of the earth. Usually our our, our uh, ozone layer will absorb these UVBs, but they're not. And that's one of the reasons why I mentioned that the sun now is appears white over it used to be yellow. And that's because the radiation, hardcore ultraviolet coming off the sun now is toxic. If you go out in the sun today, you can get a second degree burn if you're not careful. And if you look at this eclipse that is about to happen on the 21st of August, uh, you, you were, your eyes will be damaged because the corona is toxic right now. You, you need special lenses to do that. And by the way, the last eclipse of this nature is the trigger point for what started World War I and the assassination of, uh, what was it, uh, what was his name, Hel Wilhelm, uh, Hel uh, I, I forget who the, the German, German leader was. He got assassinated. It started World War One, and I have this funny feeling they're going to use that as a trigger on, on Trump because it's going to be over in Europe. Are you that. talking about because of the eclipse itself on August 21st? They'll use it as a trigger, yes. Very interesting. Hijacking that energy or something? What's that? Are they hijacking the, the energy of that powerful eclipse? Because I'm under the impression it's supposed to be a really powerful well, energetic it, it was, uh, To time rituals, you mm -hmm. always use phases of the moon. Right, yeah. Uh, Okay, that's all, that's that big judge. And you, you, all magic systems since since Solomon the King used phases of the moon. That's, uh, what was that name? Uh, uh, not Albert, since Albert Gorky. That was uh, Charlie Muses. The, and his hyperdimensional map and uh, the tantric lunar resonance meditation systems. Mm -hmm. And that's what led to the Lagrangian five states and, and so on. Yes. Our previous ancestors had mathematics to equal our own. And yes, 
They had technologies we don't even understand and were able to do things we can't, just like we can do things they couldn't. However, um, I think that there's a type of awareness growing to us. And uh, the thing that I like to quote, I like Zen Gardner. Are you familiar with Zen? Do you remember him? Yeah, I liked him. You know, they ostracized him for being children of the God. But in fact, in my opinion, he was a better writer than I am. <laughs> I thought, he, you know, I'm more knowledgeable in some ways, but he was an exceptional writer. And he wrote about the last grand illusion that each of us face. And that's at the moment of death. At the moment of death, you're given a choice. And this is all described in detail in the Bordeaux Thedal, Tibetan Book of the Dead. You have the tunnel of light with all your friends and your animal dog friends waving at, you know, to come back and join them in heaven. Or you have the blue light. And if you choose the former over the latter, you reincarnate because time is a duration of consciousness. And actually, it is a cavitation process. The past and the future is an infinity sign turned up on its side where what you have is the moment where the past is flowing into the future through that little narrow bottle. And <clears throat> that same thing is occurring with your two brains and the new adult. And so there's a metaphor here in the way we receive and understand and process time. Because of the duration of consciousness, yeah. Well said. Well, well, Richard, we're just about out of time here in the illusion of space and time. I must say, it's always a pleasure to interview you. I, I have such it's a wonderful two hours just now, wasn't it? I'm telling you, what a fabulous show! And, and I want to thank you again. And of course, if people want to contact you, the best way to do that is going to be on your website or on Facebook. Wow. And get your books and all that, right? Yeah, yeah, that's well, I just had no idea. I know we're out of time here. Everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. Thanks to Mr. Rowe, my wonderful producer, everybody here at Revolution Radio. Stay tuned for Kevin Barrett with Truth Jihad Radio. I believe that's coming up. All right, everybody, thank you. Thank you again, Richard. I just love the show. Thanks for joining. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. At a scientific conference this week at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, the startling announcement was made that archaeologists believe they have found fossilized remains of a young woman who may actually be mitochondrial Eve. Moscow's freeze. That's your cerebral cortex looking for an answer it doesn't have. See? Even your brain knows you're screwed. God is filling with adrenaline right now, whether you know it or not. The heart's beating fast. It's getting a little harder to breathe. The neurobiological system is telling it to run, but your knees are too weak to move. Fear is not real. The only place that fear can exist is in our thoughts of the future. It is a product of our imagination, causing us to fear things that do not at present and may not ever exist. That is near insanity. But do not misunderstand me. Danger is very real, but fear is a choice. We are all telling ourselves a story. You're listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. 100% listener-supported radio. Reporting the danger. Unafraid. Right here, where information never sleeps. Revolution. 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 Radio! Radio! Radio!